Thank you. Uh, it's uh, no easy task to gain some understanding of human affairs. Uh, in some respects, it's uh, even harder than the sciences. Uh, Mother, Mother Nature uh, does not provide the answers on a silver platter, uh, but at least uh, she doesn't go out of her way to set up barriers to understanding. Uh, in human affairs, that's the norm. Uh, to proceed, it is necessary to dismantle barriers that are erected by uh, doctrinal systems, by propaganda, by all the devices that uh, derive very naturally from concentration of power. Uh, sometimes we get a little help. Uh, eminent figures are kind enough to provide us with some assistance. For example, at Harvard University, there's a professorship uh, called the Professor of Science of Government, title I've always liked. The uh, Professor of Science of Government, Samuel Huntington, uh, explained the function of the Soviet threat in a leading professional journal. He said, you may have to sell intervention or other military action in such a way as to create the misimpression that it's the Soviet Union that you're fighting. That's what the United States has been doing ever since the Truman Doctrine in 1947. He's quite correct. If you look case by case, uh, you discover that quite generally the real enemy has been uh, independent nationalism. Furthermore, it's so identified in internal documents. Now, that's particularly the case when, the, when independent nationalism uh, threatens to be a virus that might infect others. Quoting Henry Kissinger, uh, he was referring in this case to the virus of uh, democratic socialism in Chile, uh, which he was afraid might infect others as far as southern Europe. It's not, of course, that he expected the Chilean armies to land in Rome, uh, but rather he was afraid that the model of uh, uh, democratic socialism might be successful in Chile and might inspire others as far as southern Europe. Uh, so therefore it had to be destroyed, as indeed it was, uh, on a day that in Latin America is often called the first 9-11. It's perceived very differently by the rich and powerful. Uh, we can learn quite a good deal about the most important topic, uh, namely ourselves, uh, by examining the effects of the two 9-11s on the societies and beyond, and also the reactions to them. Uh, it's an experiment uh, worth undertaking. If you'd like, I can add some comments later. Uh, Huntington's uh, observation about the need to create misimpressions to control the domestic population uh, illustrates what ought to be a truism, uh, namely professions of benign intent by leaders uh, should be dismissed by any rational observer for a simple reason. They're universal, virtually, uh, they're predictable, and hence they carry no information, so you should disregard them. Uh, that includes the worst monsters, incidentally, uh, Hitler, Stalin, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, Suharto, others, uh, overflowing with benign intent. Uh, recently, the foreign minister of, of Iran declared that Iran is dedicated to the cause of democracy and sovereignty in Iraq. Well, perhaps that's taken seriously by state loyalists, uh, but it's shrugged off as irrelevant by others. And the same is true when uh, President Bush, Prime Minister Blair, Condoleezza Rice, and others uh, issue similar pronouncements. In fact, it's much clearer in this case for reasons that it takes impressive effort to ignore. The reasons are occasionally expressed, though rarely. Uh, for example, recently by the prominent uh, Middle East specialist uh, Augustus Richard Norton, who wrote that as fantasies about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction were unmasked, the Bush administration increasingly stressed the democratic transformation of Iraq, and everyone jumped on the democratization bandwagon, which took some agility. Uh, it was necessary, for example, to overlook the fact that while they were orating uh, impressively about their dedication to democracy, 
U.S. and British leaders were also announcing that uh, they are among the most accomplished liars in history uh, since they had driven their countries to war because of what they repeatedly called a single question. So they had insistently proclaimed the single question was, will Saddam Hussein abandon his weapons of mass destruction programs? Uh, but that uh, disappeared quickly deep into the memory hole while the media and intellectual commentary jumped on the democratization bandwagon with only marginal exceptions. Uh, at the liberal extreme, the commentators uh, hailed what they called the president's messianic vision to bring democracy, which proved that the invasion was the most noble war in history. Uh, there were critics. The critics agreed that it was noble and generous, but perhaps uh, beyond our means, uh, the beneficiaries of our nobility are too backward, and so on. Uh, it's very hard to find an exception in media and commentary. It's another experiment I'd recommend. Well, to be fair, there is some evidence to support the near universal uh, dedication to the sudden conversion to the messianic uh, vision. The evidence is that the president, uh, Prime Minister Blair, and other worthies had issued the declaration, so therefore it must be true, uh, as in sufficiently disciplined circles in Iran, I suppose, or when the... Uh, dear leader issues pronouncements in North Korea. In the present case, counter evidence is overwhelming. You could return to that if you like, but it's irrelevant. The leader has spoken. End of story. Uh, well, returning to the uh, science of government, the professor of the science of government at Harvard, uh, he was actually writing in 1981. And by then it was becoming fairly clear that the pretense that it's uh, the Soviet Union that you're fighting was going to become a much harder sell. Uh, that was understood by the Reagan administration. It's the current incumbents in Washington or their uh, immediate mentors. They took office in 1981, as you know, and they immediately declared that the enemy they are fighting is international terrorism, uh, which they described as the plague of the modern era, return to barbarism in our times, and so on. They redeclared their war on terror with much the same rhetoric in 2001. Stress redeclared. Uh, it's been quite important to suppress the record of the first declared war on terror, and that task of suppression has been carried out brilliantly. The first war on terror declared in 1981 instantly became a massive terrorist war an uh, enormous uh, state terrorist assault on the population of most of Central America, uh, armed, directed, and funded by Washington. When there was finally an independent accounting, uh, the atrocities were almost all attributed to state terrorists, as those who were paying any attention knew all along. Uh, state terror left some 200,000 corpses, uh, huge numbers of other victims, uh, the societies, in some cases, barely survive. In one of the countries that was under attack, uh, the population had an army to defend it. Uh, in the others, the terrorists were the security forces armed and directed by Washington and its clients, so the toll was far worse. Uh, but it was awful enough even in Nicaragua, uh, which, uh, contrary to doctrine, uh, had a democratic election in 1984 that was probably the most uh, closely and expertly supervised in history. I was praised as fair, even by hostile observers, but those are the wrong facts, so they've been wiped out of history. Uh, in Nicaragua, the death toll from the U.S.-run international terrorist war uh, was equivalent in uh, per capita equivalent terms in the United States. It would be equivalent to about uh, two and a half million dead in the United States. That's greater than the combined total of all wars in U.S. history, including the Civil War. The country was reduced to the second poorest in the hemisphere uh, after Haiti, uh, which uh, incidentally also holds the prize as the prime target of U.S. intervention in the past century. 
Nicaragua shares second place in intervention with Guatemala, which also vies with Nicaragua for the prize of the second poor and poorest country in the hemisphere. It's one of those interesting historical correlations we're trained to ignore. Uh, by now, 60% uh, of Nicaraguan children under two suffer severe malnutrition, probable permanent brain damage. That's quite a change from 20 years earlier when Washington was panicked by reports from uh, the World Bank, uh, UNICEF, uh, other international agencies about what they called Nicaragua's remarkable achievements that were laying a solid foundation for long-term socioeconomic development as the country enjoyed one of the most dramatic improvements in child survival in the developing world and was therefore one of those viruses that had to be exterminated under the pretext that it was engaged in international terrorism, as in a sense it was, as the victim of the worst international terrorist attack in the hemisphere in those years. Uh, the problem of uh, severe malnutrition and likely brain damage among Nicaraguan children uh, happens to be very easy to solve uh, in quite conservative ways. Uh, the United States uh, could pay its debts as ordered by the highest international authorities. The World Court, uh, which uh, condemned the United States for international terrorism and ordered it to pay massive reparations, and the United Nations Security Council, which affirmed the court judgment in two resolutions, which the United States vetoed, uh, proceeding to escalate the attack. Uh, all of this is excluded from doctrinally approved history, and it's probably close to a historical universal that systems of power suppress their own crimes, although it is much more revealing when that takes place under conditions of freedom, as in our case, and far more important to us when we ourselves are engaging in the practice for reasons too obvious to discuss. Uh, we can see how uh, effectively unwanted truths are uh, disappeared by looking at the reaction to the appointment of uh, John Negroponte as the first director of intelligence. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, he was the ambassador to Honduras, where he ran the largest CIA station in the world, and not because uh, Honduras was of any grand importance in the world scene, but because Honduras was providing the bases for the U.S. terrorist army, the mercenary terrorist army that was attacking Nicaragua, and Negroponte's role was to supervise those operations. And we learn quite a lot about ourselves by looking at the reaction to the appointment of a condemned international terrorist to the position of the world's leading counter-terror czar. Uh, the atrocities in Guatemala and El Salvador were far worse, uh, but the U.S. role is deeply concealed in ways that are dramatic and shameful uh, right at this moment, in fact. Again, can elaborate, but I don't want to get too far off track. Uh, so let me return to the main theme. As the Soviet threat lost its effectiveness in controlling the domestic population here, uh, new demons had to be concocted. Well, at first it was states that support terror, and that was a little inconvenient uh, because even with a tremendous discipline, it's hard to conceal the fact that Washington is a leading example, uh, not only in Central America. Uh, by the 1990s, a new concept was created, uh, rogue states, uh, but that was problematic too because it takes some discipline to suppress the fact that by the late 1990s, uh, much of the world regarded the United States, I'm quoting, as the rogue superpower, the greatest single external threat to their societies, and in the eyes of much of the world, the prime rogue state today is the United States. Uh, again, I'm quoting from the most prestigious authorities in leading professional journals, uh, Samuel Huntington again, and Robert Jervis, who was then president of the American Political Science Association. Uh, both of them warned that the rogue superpower was creating potential threats to itself by threatening the existence of other societies. Actually, that was during the Clinton years. 
Bush soon succeeded in greatly increasing the threat to others, and hence to the United States as well. And by now, a fear and often hatred of the United States has reached unprecedented heights worldwide, even in Europe, with opposing obvious threats to us. Uh, it's more comfortable to ignore such matters or to blame them on uh, envy or uh, inveterate uh, anti-Americanism or some other strange pathology that's rampant uh, outside our borders. Uh, but we do so at our peril. And our peril is very real. And what I'd like to do now is turn to some of the imminent crises that are very serious and are getting worse. Um, I'd like to say a few words about three of these crises, which are unusually severe because they reach the level, literally, of human survival. Uh, the first one is environmental catastrophe. Second is nuclear war. And the third is the growing uh, democratic deficit, or a term we use for others, uh, that is the impressive success uh, in excluding from the political arena in the United States the one force that can avert the other two crises, namely the domestic population, which is quite typically the enemy, the main enemy of any system of power, in our case, the enemy of the state corporate nexus. Uh, we can, in fact, borrow another term that's been invented in the past few years to justify the resort to force in international affairs, uh, the term failed states from which we must protect ourselves and which we must help, uh, often by devastating them. Uh, the term is used to refer to states that cannot protect their citizens from violence, maybe even destruction, and that have a democratic deficit, uh, perhaps democratic forms but without real substance. Uh, regrettably, the United States is coming to share these characteristics, I mean the U.S. government, a serious danger to its own country and because of our power to the world. Well, on the first crisis, the environmental catastrophe, uh, likely catastrophe, I can be brief. Uh, there's by now an overwhelming scientific consensus that the threat is very real, uh, unpredictable in detail, but possibly very severe, and that urgent action is needed if future generations are to have a chance for decent survival. There have been, as you know, particularly today, Earth Day, there have been international efforts to deal with the crisis, at least in limited ways. The recent uh, Kyoto Treaty is an example. Uh, you read in the media that the United States was one of the few countries that refused to accept the treaty a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's true uh, only if we understand the United States to include the population of the United States, to exclude the population of the United States. The population of the country overwhelmingly favors the treaty, in fact so enthusiastically that a majority of Bush voters assume that he favored it because it's so obviously the right thing to do. Uh, these facts bear on the third crisis, the democratic deficit. It's one of many crucial examples illustrating that the bipartisan media consensus is far to the right of the general population, uh, which is, I suppose, why such facts about public opinion are scarcely reported. I'll come back to that. Well, let's turn first to the second in a crisis, nuclear war, which would mean, uh, in effect, uh, an end to biology's only experiment with higher intelligence. It would show that the experiment was a mistake. Uh, one of the uh, most uh, prominent strategic analysts internationally uh, wrote recently that under current policies, uh, largely driven by Washington, a nuclear exchange is ultimately inevitable. He explained the reasons. That's uh, former NATO planner uh, Michael McGuire writing in the Journal of Britain's Royal Institute of International Affairs. It's the most prestigious international affairs journal in Europe. Uh, comparing the two crises that threaten survival, literally the environmental crisis and nuclear war, and McGuire has this to say, uh, by comparison with global warming,
the cost of eliminating nuclear weapons would be small, but the catastrophic results of global nuclear war would greatly exceed those of progressive climate ch change because the effects would be instantaneous and could not be mitigated. Uh, the irony of the situation is that it is in our power to eliminate the threat of the threat of global nuclear war, but climate change can no longer be evaded. Uh, to achieve that result, however, the democratic deficit in the United States will have to be overcome. Uh, just how imminent the threat is, no one can say, of course. Uh, the world has come very close to possible terminal nuclear war in the past, repeatedly, eliciting very little comment or interest. Some of the very recent illustrations are really uh, utterly astonishing. I'll come back to that, too. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, NET, is commonly regarded as the foundation of any serious hope uh, for uh, avoiding the inevitable destruction that's virtually guaranteed by the inexorable logic of nuclear weapons. Uh, in a few weeks, the five-year review of a review conference of the NPT is going to take place. Uh, in an article that just appeared, uh, Thomas Graham, who's the former U.S. Special Representative for Arms Control, uh, Disarmament, and Nonproliferation, uh, he writes that uh, the NPT has never seemed weaker or the future less certain. If the treaty should fail in the coming weeks, he warns, a nuclear nightmare world might, may become reality. The primary threat to the NPT, as he and others stress, is U.S. government policy, although other nuclear states share some of the responsibility. The treaty was a compact in which the nuclear powers pledged to undertake good faith efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons. Uh, none of them have, and the Bush administration has gone beyond declaring that it no longer accepts that core provision of the NPT, and furthermore, it is even planning to violate it more extensively by developing new nuclear weapons, which will be the end of the treaty. Uh, the NPT bargain was based on a commitment to, quite explicit, to several additional treaties. The first was the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which was rejected by the Republican Senate in 1999 and declared off the agenda by Bush. The ABM Treaty, which Bush rescinded, and most important, a verifiable fissile material cutoff treaty, called FISPAN for short, uh, which would block the dread threat of adding more nuclear bomb material to the vast amount already existing. It's quoting Graham again. Uh, last November, the uh, United Nations Committee on Disarmament voted in favor of a verifiable FISPAN. Uh, the vote was 147 to 1, with two abstentions, uh, Israel, which is reflexive, and Britain, which explained its abstention on the grounds that the resolution, I'm quoting, the resolution had divided the international community at a time when progress should be a prime objective. It had divided the international community 147 to 1. Uh, a uh, unilateral uh, U.S. vote is, in effect, uh, a veto. Uh, in fact, a double veto, because it's blocked and it's also vetoed from reporting in history. In this case, the veto was a gift that was doubtless uh, welcomed by Osama bin Laden, who would be delighted to see more nuclear bomb material added to the vast amount already existing. Well, looking at that, we gain some further insight into the ranking of survival of the species on the list of priorities of uh, government planners and uh, also on the part of information systems. I'm sure you're all literate people uh, with far better resources than most, but I doubt if many of you have ever heard of any of this, uh, so though it's of the utmost significance, literally, for survival of the species. Uh, McGuire's uh, warnings are echoed on this side of the Atlantic, for example, in a recent article by Senator Sam Nunn, 
former chairman of the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee and one of the leading figures in efforts to reduce the threat of nuclear war. Uh, he warned that the chances of an accidental, mistaken, or unauthorized nuclear attack might be increasing uh, as a result of policy choices that leave um, U.S. policy choices that leave America's survival dependent on the accuracy of Russia's warning systems and its command and control, we are running a risk of an Armageddon of our own making. Uh, Senator Nunn is referring to the sharp expansion of U.S. military programs, the Rumsfeld transformation of the military, which tilt the strategic balance in ways which make Russia more likely to launch upon warning of an attack without waiting to see if the warning is accurate. And that threat is enhanced by the fact that the Russian early warning system is in serious disrepair, uh, the result of the economic catastrophe of the last 15 years, uh, and much more likely to give a false warning of incoming missiles. It's even more dangerous than the U.S. counterpart. Uh, U.S. reliance, still quoting none, U.S. reliance on the high alert hair trigger nuclear posture allows missiles to be launched within minutes, actually three minutes, forcing our leaders to decide almost instantly whether to launch nuclear weapons once they have warning of an attack, robbing of the, um, them of the time they may need to gather data, exchange information, gain perspective, discover an error, and avoid a catastrophic mistake. And there have been many close calls, uh, even with the much more reliable U.S. systems. In the uh, most sober and respectable journals in the United States, in this case the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, prominent strategic analysts warn that Washington's current military programs and aggressive stance carry, quoting, an appreciable risk of ultimate doom. They urge, I'll continue to quote, they urge that the U.S. political system alter its traditional practice of threat designation and resort to force, and that the U.S. political system should acknowledge that the United States is now the dominant threat to everyone else. Unless fundamental questions about coercive prevention and imperial dominance are seriously addressed, the United States will not remain a democracy worthy of the name. To paraphrase, uh, one might reasonably conclude that it will be a failed state endangering its own population with democrat forms that have little substance. Uh, the authors go on to point out that the terrifying technology now being developed in the Rumsfeld transformation of the military will assuredly diffuse to the rest of the world, creating rising danger, potentially an unmanageable one, of course, for Americans as well. And they go on to express the hope that the threat of U.S. militarism and aggressiveness will be countered by a coalition of peace-loving nations led by China. They select China because of all the nuclear states, quoting, that it has maintained by far the most restrained pattern of military deployment, and it has been in the forefront of the efforts of the United Nations to block the unilateral U.S. refusal to sustain the commitment to preserve space for peaceful purposes. Well, we've come to a pretty pass when such thoughts are expressed at the heart of the establishment, and what that implies about the state of American democracy, where the issues scarcely even enter into the electoral arena, now that's no less shocking and threatening, once again, the democratic deficit. Well, the threat to everyone else, hence to ourselves, is becoming much more serious as the radical nationalists of the Bush administration extend Clinton's doctrine of control of space for military purposes and his refusal to join the rest of the world, Israel is the only exception, uh, in renewal and extension of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which restricted space to peaceful uses. It's China that's been leading the opposition to that. Uh, in the Bush version, 
the U.S. is to proceed from control of space to ownership of space for military purposes, which may mean instant engagement anywhere in the world, I'm quoting from Bush's Air Force Space Command, uh, putting any part of the world at risk of instant destruction thanks to sophisticated global surveillance and lethal offensive weaponry in space and reciprocally endangering the people of the United States as well in the customary pattern. Uh, a related concern is that nuclear weapons may sooner that nuclear weapons may sooner or later fall into the hands of terrorist groups who might use weapons of mass destruction with lethal effect. And those grim prospects are also being advanced by Bush administration planners, quite consciously. These are no secrets. Uh, exactly as had been predicted, their aggressive militarism has driven Russia to significant expansion of offensive capacities and is also compelling Russia to transfer nuclear weapons constantly across its huge territory to counter mounting U.S. threats. Uh, leading strategic analyst Bruce Blair, head of the Center for Defense Information, points out recently that this perpetual motion creates a serious vulnerability because transportation is the Achilles heel of nuclear weapon security, ranking in, da in danger right alongside maintaining strategic nuclear forces on hair trigger alert. The possibility of terrorists grabbing such a weapon as it shuttles between deployment fields and factories in an effort to counter growing U.S. military threats could spell eventual disaster for an American city if they're stolen, say, by Chechen rebels. Uh, but even worse, the seizure of a ready-to-fire long-range strategic nuclear, strategic long-range nuclear missile or a group of missiles capable of delivering bombs to targets thousands of miles away could be apocalyptic for entire nations, in fact, for the world. And that risk, he says, extends beyond Russia. Uh, quoting, still quoting, the early warning and control problems plaguing Pakistan, India, and other nuclear proliferators are even more acute. And as these nations move towards hair trigger stances for their nuclear missiles, the terrorist threat to them will grow in parallel. And the logic is well understood. Uh, the U.S. Is drive, has already driven Russia to adopt the U.S. policy of uh, launch on warning, hair triggered response. It will, if it continues, force China to do the same. India will react to China, Pakistan will react to India, and we're off and running. Uh, the uh, dangers are being consciously escalated by the threat and use of violence, which has long been predicted, is stimulating nuclear proliferation, along with the uh, jihadi terrorism that traces back to Reagan administration programs to organize, arm, and train radical Islamists, and not for the defense of Afghanistan, as was proclaimed, but for the more uh, usual and ugly reasons of state. While Washington's programs and policy choices are not the only factor driving these developments, but they are certainly a significant one, and most agree the most significant one, they fall within a much broader context with roots going back to the Clinton administration and beyond, uh, but now being taken in even more ominous directions by the Bush administration. Uh, all of this is almost entirely out of the range of public discourse and does not even enter marginally into electoral choices. And that is another illustration of the third of the imminent crises I mentioned, the significant decline of functioning democracy. Uh, the invasion of Iraq is only the most striking of the many examples of the limited concern of Washington planners for terrorism and possibly nuclear destruction. It was undertaken with the expectation that it would probably increase the threat of terror. That was predicted by intelligence agencies and strategic analysts worldwide, and was also predicted by U.S. intelligence. Uh, agencies gave a report to the president a few weeks before the invasion where that's what they predicted. And the predictions came true as widely recognized by the same specialists and intelligence agencies, including U.S. intelligence. 
its most recent analysis concludes that the invasion of Iraq created a new training area for professional terrorists who will disperse throughout the world, replacing the Afghan havens that were established at first by the Reagan administration and its British and Pakistani allies. Uh, the U.S. and Britain proclaimed the right to invade Iraq because it was developing weapons of mass destruction. That was, again, the single question. Their phrase, as stressed constantly by Bush and Blair and other high officials. Well, it's now conceded that the only weapons of mass destruction were those that were produced in the 1980s, uh, thanks to aid provided by the U.S. and Britain, along with others. Uh, aid that incidentally continued long after Saddam's worst atrocities and the end of the war, war with Iran. Uh, George Bush the first had no concern with that as he continued to provide means for developing weapons of mass destruction. Uh, after the uh, 2003 invasion, there was sophisticated massive looting of the installations that were constructed in the 1980s. Now, that includes uh, high precision equipment capable of making parts for nuclear and chemical weapons and missiles, and also uh, lethal toxins that can be used for biological weapons. Prior to the 2003 invasion, these sites had been controlled by UN inspectors. Nobody could get to them, but they were kicked out of the country and they've been kept out since. Uh, meanwhile, the Rumsfeld uh, Wolfowitz occupation forces left the sites unguarded and they've been massively looted. Uh, where this uh, huge mass equipment has gone, no one knows, and it's not very comfortable to guess. Uh, ironies are almost inexpressible. Uh, the U.S. and Britain allegedly invaded to prevent the use of weapons of mass destruction that did not exist, and it, they succeeded in providing the terrorists that they had mobilized with the means to develop weapons of mass destruction that the U.S. and Britain had provided to Saddam. Now, those would be regular headlines, screaming headlines in a free press in a functioning democratic society. I think it's unnecessary to stress that. Well, there are many other uh, illustrations of the willingness of top planners to risk increase of international terrorism, uh, and they reveal that terrorism is simply not a high priority. It's not that planners want terrorism, it's just not a high priority in comparison with other objectives, such as controlling the world's major energy resources, which is a very powerful lever of world control. Uh, one of the more astute of the senior planners and analysts, Zbigniew Brzezinski, former national security advisor, uh, recently pointed out that the occupation of Iraq gives the United States what he called critical leverage over its European Asian rivals. Uh, actually, he was reiterating the conclusions of uh, leading planners after, right after World War II who recognized that control over what the State Department called the stupendous source of strategic power in the Gulf region, region control over that, would give the U.S. veto power over its industrial rivals. That was George Kennan in this case, uh, in his days as a top planner. Uh, it's a rational calculation on the assumption that human survival is not particularly significant in comparison with short-term power and wealth. And that's nothing new. Uh, those themes resonate throughout history, not here but everywhere. Uh, the difference today is that the stakes are enormously higher. Like most, most other serious analysts, and Michael McGuire concludes that the only hope for decent survival is the elimination of nuclear weapons in accord with the NPT and adherence to international law. Uh, on the Iraq invasion, he writes, there were many reasons for concluding before the event that the decision to wage war in Iraq was fundamentally flawed. But in the longer term, by far the most important was that the decision repudiated a century of slow, intermittent, and often painful progress towards an international system based on cooperative security 
multilateral decision making, collective action, agreed norms of behavior, and a steadily growing fabric of law. It's the thin fabric on which the hopes for survival precariously hang. It's now being torn to shreds by Washington, which brings us to the third crisis, the growing democratic deficit. For a functioning democratic society, it's plainly necessary for citizens to be aware of public opinion and to participate in the formation of public policy. So take Spain, for example, far from an ideal democracy. Uh, a year ago, Spain was bitterly condemned for capitulating to terrorism, for capitulating to terrorism because voters chose to withdraw troops from Iraq unless they are under UN supervision. Uh, unmentioned in the denunciations of Spanish cowardice was that this was also the position of 70% of the American public. In fact, it had been for a long time. Uh, since April 2003, a large majority called for the UN to take the lead in reconstruction, political transition, and security in Iraq, with the US participating but not leading the operations, essentially what Spanish voters voted for. Uh, the two countries differ in that Spanish voters were aware of public opinion, while here people can find out only by conducting a research project. Uh, and Spanish voters had a choice, unlike here, uh, where the issue is off the agenda for the bipartisan consensus and the media. Not a word about it in the last elections. In fact, the scale of the democratic deficit uh, was revealed quite dramatically by the November 2004 presidential election. Uh, immediately before the election, Major studies were released by the most prestigious institutions that monitor public opinion. In a functioning democratic society, these would have been front page news and the focus of commentary and discussion. Here, the reports were scarcely mentioned in the national press, not at all. Uh, a look at what they revealed suggests a reason. The studies revealed a very sharp divide between the public and the bipartisan media consensus. I've already mentioned the Kyoto Treaty in Iraq, but the same was true very broadly. For example, it was true of the crucial question of international law and the use of force. A large majority of the public continued to take the traditional position uh, that it expressed in the UN Charter that states are entitled to use force, I'm quoting now, only if there is strong evidence that the country is in imminent danger of being attacked. So that means that a large majority in the country reject the bipartisan consensus on so-called preemptive war and agree with a recent high-level United Nations panel, which included the National Security Advisor for Bush number one, that this fundamental principle enshrined in the UN Charter should remain without revision. Uh, the divide between the public and the elite consensus extends far beyond that. So large majorities believe that the United States should accept the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court uh, and the World Court and should rely on the United Nations to take the lead in international crises. Surprise, amazingly, a majority even believe that the United States should abandon the Security Council veto and accept majority rule, even if it doesn't like the decisions. Uh, large majorities believe that the United States should rely on diplomatic and economic measures more than military ones in the so-called war on terror, and overwhelming majorities, as in the past, uh, favor increased government spending on health care, education, and other you know, social spending. All of this is in sharp opposition to the bipartisan consensus. Uh, these conclusions were underscored further in a major study of public reactions to the federal budget announced in February, again by the most prestigious institution that studies monitors public attitudes. This is just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the public calls for sharp cuts in military spending, along with sharply increased social spending. 
for education, medical research, job training, conservation, and renewable energy, uh, as well as increased spending for the United Nations and economic and humanitarian aid and reversal of Bush's tax cuts for the wealthy. Uh, government policy is dramatically the opposite in every respect. As far as I know, those, that study was unreported. Uh, that means that the public is not only removed from the area of policy formation, but it's also kept unaware of public opinion. Uh, these are matters that bear directly on the state of contemporary American democracy and should be of some concern, uh, not only here given U.S. state power. Uh, to ensure that the public is excluded from public policy, Elections are by now almost entirely run by the public relations industry. That's the people who sell uh, toothpaste and lifestyle drugs and cars and other commodities. Uh, when you look at a TV ad, uh, you don't expect to be informed. So if a car manufacturer, say, wanted to provide information, it would produce a brief statement describing the characteristics of the next year's models. It wouldn't present an image of a car uh, driven by a sexy actress uh, racing up some kind of a sheer cliff uh, to a heavenly future and all the rest of what you see on television. Uh, and we all know this very well. I mean, we all know, if we stop to think about it, that business despises and fears uh, the markets of orthodox economic doctrine. Like an economics course, you learn that in a market, uh, informed consumers make rational choices. Uh, in the United States, uh, business spends hundreds of billions of dollars a year to prevent that horrible outcome, uh, projecting imagery uh, to delude consumers. Uh, I'm not telling you anything that everybody doesn't know. Uh, uncontroversially, that's the goal of advertising. Its not, goal is not to provide information. Actually, this observation is as old as Adam Smith, uh, who we are taught to revere, but not to read. It's a mistake. Uh, he, uh, very interesting to read, he warned that the interest of merchants and manufacturers is to deceive or even to oppress the public, as they have done on many occasions. But by now, they're served with huge, by huge industries that have been developed for this purpose. And the dedication to deceit and delusion is quite extraordinary. So, for example, uh, uh, a trade agreement with Australia has been held up for a long time because U.S. negotiators uh, demanded that Australia ban the policies that have given it probably the most efficient health care system in the world, uh, including the requirement that advertising be evidence-based. That's the technical phrase. They require that advertising be evidence-based. So you can't have an ad on TV for some new high-priced drug uh, with a sports hero uh, saying, uh, ask your doctor if this is right for you, it's right for me. Uh, if you want to demand a higher price, you've got to provide evidence that the drug does something. Uh, U.S. negotiators object to that, and they insisted that the publicly subsidized private tyrannies, which is what corporations are, must have a right to deceive or even oppress the public, in Adam Smith's words, and must have the opportunity to undermine the markets of economic doctrine. Actually, if you take a careful look, the famous concepts of uh, entrepreneurial initiative and trade and others fare a little better on analysis. Uh, in fact, the scale of advertising is a pretty good measure of the limits of markets. In real markets, there's no advertising apart from providing information. And actually, that was true in earlier US history through the 19th century, when there was a fairly close approximation to markets, nothing remotely like that anymore. Uh, it does remain, it, there still are some corners of the economic system in which uh, really competitive markets exist. And in those corners, it's as we'd expect, there's no advertising. So take, say, selling stocks, which is a market. Uh, if you want to sell 10 shares in GM, you don't put up ads on TV. Uh, you just inform people that 
you have them for sale, and you sell them at the market price. That's what happens in markets. The scale of advertising is a pretty good measure of the deterioration of markets. Well, when the public relations industry is given the task of selling candidates, it quite naturally resorts to the same techniques as in selling commodities, projecting imagery to delude voters. So deceit is employed to undermine democracy, just as it's the natural device to undermine markets. And we saw that pretty dramatically last November. As the polls showed, voters had very little idea of the stand of the candidates on issues, and in fact, many false beliefs. Typically, they had false beliefs about the candidates, just like the one about the Kyoto Treaty, just assuming that they had the candidates shared their beliefs, even if it was radically false. Uh, that didn't happen because voters are stupid. Uh, that didn't happen because voters are stupid, but because great care is taken to keep the focus of the campaigns on what the uh, advertising industry call qualities, not issues. And as it turned out, uh, the imagery that was concocted by the Republican PR apparatus obtained about 31% of the electoral vote and that of their opponents about 29%. Uh, in proceedings that we would dismiss as a farcical non-election in a failed state if it had been conducted by some enemy. The official propaganda is that the decisive factor was what are called moral issues, but we are rarely told what these are. So you have to search to discover, for example, that for a large majority of the population, it's a high-ranking moral issue for the government to provide decent health care to everyone, uh, and or to find that among the highest-ranking moral issues are greed and materialism and poverty and economic justice, ranking much higher than abortion and gay marriage. A, a person's moral commitments are determined by his or her actions, not by pretty words, which are cheap. Uh, we all know that. Uh, the business world certainly knows that. So the day after the elections, the business world uh, reported euphoria in boardrooms, and not because uh, CEOs are opposed to gay marriage. In fact, they're not. Uh, what they care about is transfer of public resources to their pockets. And these gifts they receive uh, in the sharp tax cuts for the wealthy that the public opposes and in uh, legislation. So, for example, the bankruptcy bill that was just passed it was written by the credit card industry, as the Wall Street Journal happily reported in a front page story. Uh, the bill written by the industry transfers liability for risky loans with high yield to the borrower, not the lender, to the poor, not the rich. It's not a principle of capitalism. It's not a principle of economic theory, but it's a very important issue for those whose moral values are to serve private concentrations of wealth. Actually, domestic policies can be predicted with remarkable accuracy by simply answering the question, who gains and who pays the costs? Uh, consistently, concentrated private wealth and power gain, and the costs are borne by the majority of the public and by future generations. Those are the operative moral values. No time to run through examples here, but again, it's an instructive experiment. Well, I've said very little about the effect of our actions and choices on the rest of the world, it's of course enormous, given our wealth and power. Uh, but even apart from that, the imminent crises that I've mentioned uh, should be a primary concern for people of my age who care about the world that we're leaving to our grandchildren and also to younger people who will have the task of dealing responsibly with these crises, at least if they share the same concerns about their own lives and about the generations to follow. Thanks.
Well, this is all a black hole as far as I'm concerned. I assume there are people out there, but uh, can't see them. But we have about half an hour for yeah. questions. Okay, I was told there are some mics out there. I can't see them. I'm, ah, good. Can you raise the light? Yeah. Okay. Where, where, where are they? There's microphones just here. Oh, I see. There's one. And here. And there's people one. will queue okay. up at those. Okay. If you could queue up behind the mics, we can just go up and back. Yeah. Go ahead. Good day, and thank you for visiting Washington State University. I recently saw a document that says that the United States is moving toward being a fascist state, if it hasn't already. And it looks as evidence of a uh, strong banner of nationalism, the vilification of, of uh, minorities, and they're talking about uh, gays and lesbians as, as one of those, uh, such things as claiming to be the guardians of morality, the suppression of dissent, and so forth and so forth. Do you think that that's too strong a, a, a statement, or how would you frame that? Um. Well, you know, your judgment's as good as mine. It's a subjective judgment, so I have nothing to say that tells anything you don't know. But uh, it, we should remember, however, that this is the uh, fact of the matter is that we, uh, there's all kind of things wrong with U.S. government policy and the country and so on, but there's a lot that's right with it. And one of the things that's right with it is it's the freest country in the world. Um, it's about the only country in the world where there's real protection of freedom of speech, for example. I mean, there isn't in England. Uh, in France, they don't even understand the concept, uh, literally. Uh, and th that was not given as a gift from above. It was won from below. In fact, the... Uh, yeah. The Supreme Court finally uh, uh, really reached... A, an enlightenment standard, an 18th century standard of freedom of speech in the course of the civil rights movement in the early 1960s. It's part of the civil rights movement, which is these popular movements that compel institutions to react to advance justice and freedom. But that's a tremendous thing, and it's not the only example. I mean, whatever one thinks, by comparative standards, we're very free. Everything you described is correct. Uh, but it goes way back. You know, in fact, about uh, 30 years ago, I guess it was, one of the uh, well-known um, sociologists, Bertram Gross, uh, wrote a book called Friendly Fascism, describing what he thought would be the U.S. evolution towards the kind of fascism without, you know, concentration camps. Uh, going back further, around 1940, I suppose, uh, maybe the leading political economist in U.S. history, Robert Brady, a Veblenite economist, wrote pretty much the same thing. Uh, he was also a historian of fascism, and he pointed out similarities. As far as the repression of dissent is concerned, I mean, that's been going on through American history, and attacks on minorities I don't even have to talk about. After all, this was a slave society. You know, it was for hundreds of years before uh, slaves even got actual rights to vote just in the 60s. And the indigenous population, the part that was not exterminated is, you know, well, I don't have to tell you. Uh, and we can go on and on. Uh, I mean, like, you know, I'm Jewish. I mean, I grew up in a period not that long ago when anti-Semitism was just rampant, you know, everywhere. I mean, where I lived, I mean, at Harvard when I got there, you know, everywhere. Uh, so discrimination against minorities is way, goes way back. Uh, suppression of dissent has been far worse than it is now. Uh, there is nothing to com in American history to compare with Woodrow Wilson's uh, Red Scare, which was devastating. It crushed independent thought, destroyed the labor movement, uh, you know, threw out thousands of people they didn't like. Uh, awful. And there's been progress in that respect, but it's a danger, and you have to keep alert to it. Uh, my, my own guess is that there's a strong enough... Uh, resistance to state oppression that it won't get as far as the people in the White House would like. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's not something you can just take for granted. You have to fight for it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Chomsky, first of all, thank you for the speech. It was certainly the most uh, relevant, accurate uh, speech about modern politics that I've ever heard. 
but uh, on the microphone. Uh, you've said previously, and I'm quoting, part of the whole technique of disempowering people is to make sure that the real agents of change fall out of history and are never recognized in the culture for what they are. So it's necessary to distort history and make it look as if great men did everything. That's part of how you teach people they can't do anything. They're helpless. They just have to wait for some great man to come along and do it for them. And my question, I, I, I had that in mind after your lecture last night at Gonzaga. Uh, when you finished, everybody just filed out the exits, some 3,000 persons. And um, there was zero effort to take advantage of that unusual collection of progressive energy and to materialize it into new membership, uh, new organization memberships, or raising money just to cite two possibilities, to memberships, or raising money just to cite two possibilities. Um, I was really sad about that. Could you talk about your role in the process of progressive change and the importance of just seizing every opportunity to organize? I completely agree with you. In fact, I feel that all the time. Uh, what there should have been and should be always is uh, tables outside with uh, books, uh, sign-up forms, information, and so on. So if people are really interested in what they hear, they'll have a chance to do something about it. Uh, otherwise, exactly as you say, the energy dissipates. But those are things that have to be done by local organization. And the democratic deficit in the United States is based on the fact that there has been success in separating people from one another. Um, there's plenty of involvement, energy, excitement. I, there's probably more, if you count noses, there are more activists now probably than ever. And if you look at public opinion of the kind that I mentioned, they've got an open feel in front of them. I mean, most of the public already agrees. Uh, but what has, uh, what has, what the institutional structure has succeeded in doing is making people extremely isolated. You know, so it's kind of you and your television set. It's the ideal social unit. Uh, and if that's, uh, if that's what society becomes, it doesn't matter what your ideas are. Uh, you have to, as people used to put it, talk to your neighbors and work with them. And, and that's the essence of democracy, too. That if you take a look at our own past or at countries that have more democratic elections today, and there are plenty, uh, that's what happens. So just take, say, the U.S. primary system. I mean, the way primaries work here, uh, say the first primary in New Hampshire, uh, candidates come to town, and they call their party managers call a meeting, and the candidate says uh, some really meaningless things, and uh, then they go home. I mean, if you had a democratic society, it would work totally differently. I mean, what would happen is the people in the town would have been working constantly all the time, not just at elections. And at the time of the election, they'd get together and say, here are the kind of things we want. Uh, and if someone comes in, they shouldn't listen to him. They should say, look, here's our program. Uh, if you're willing to stand up for this program, we may vote for you. Otherwise, go home. Uh, that would be the basis for a democratic society. And that's true of just any. And, uh, uh, and uh, the important thing is it's all very much within our power. You know, it's not that we're helpless. I mean, take the NPT, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, and may be a fateful moment. I mean, if that collapses, there may be real disaster. And we can organize this to make the U.S. accepted. You know, this is a very free country. It can be done, but not if people are stuck alone with their television set. And there are many means for imposing this on people. I mean, infants, you know, from infancy, kids are deluged with propaganda about this. And when I watch television with my grandchildren, it's appalling. Uh, the, uh, furthermore, just the economic system is set up that way. Part of the technique of controlling people for the last 25 years has been to undermine the economy. I mean, we've been through a very strange period of economic history, in fact, unique. Uh, for the last 25 years, uh, real wages for the majority have either stagnated or declined. Uh, people are keeping up family incomes only by sharply increasing work hours. Uh, two members of the family working not because they want to, because they have to. 
Uh, and uh, we have the heaviest in workload in the industrial world right now, I think. Uh, well, you know, people are working 50 hours a week to put the food on the table, uh, and uh, their kids are uh, deluged with propaganda saying, buy me this, that, and the other thing. Uh, what happens is what we see. They don't have time to find out about anything. They don't have time for research projects. The media aren't telling them the important things. Uh, what they do is max out on credit card, and then they get smashed by the bankruptcy bill that was just passed. Uh, the, uh, that has to be overcome, you know, and it's not beyond our capacity, but it's not going to happen by, our, by itself. I mean, any more than the civil rights movement happened by itself, or women's rights were won by themselves, or anything. Slavery ended. I mean, it's all the same way. It just takes hard, consistent work. It's a lot easier here than almost anywhere else. And we're doing less of it than other people. That's something we've got to be worried about. Professor Chomsky, first of all, thank you. It truly is an honor uh, hearing you speak today. Uh, forgive my irreverence as a man from Massachusetts. I'm sure you can understand the connection to a Red Sox hat. Right. <laughs> uh, my question actually fits nicely with what you just said. I, I'd like to hear your comments about the role of third parties in bridging the the democracy gap or the democratic deficit, as you called it. Uh, if my information is correct, you supported Ralph Nader in the 2000 election. Uh, do you think that one of the, one of the tenets in, in, in Nader's uh, platform is that the election procedure needs to be restructured, that is the, the bureaucracy is responsible for organizing it and orchestrating it. Everything from the debates to the financing needs to be restructured to allow for third parties. My question is, do you think it's necessarily or it's a, it's a necessity to augment the two-party system, or is it, is it not fair to blame the, the organizational structures in, instead of ourselves and our own, our own uh, apathy and our own lack of involvement and lack of information at the grassroots level? I understand. Well, just uh, thanks for mentioning the Red Sox. <laughs> just Sunday, I have a grandson who's a super jock and took him to the Red Sox game last Sunday, so I'm right in the right mood. Uh, they, they won, too. So. Uh, as for my own attitude toward Nader, I took the same position in the year 2000 that I took in 2004, contrary to what you read on the Nader website. The position was that in swing states, you know, where the vote matters, uh, you should vote against the worst candidate, which happened to be Bush by a long shot, in my opinion. Uh, but, uh, and uh, now that happened. I mean, that means pushing the Democratic ticket, whether you like it or not. That's the, ch that's the rational choice, in my opinion. In non-swing states, like, say, Massachusetts, where the outcome is predetermined, you do what you want. And then there are a lot of considerations. Like developing an independent electoral alternative is a consideration. Well, then comes the question, do I vote for Nader? Do I vote for the Green Party? Uh, do something else? Uh, but and uh, it... Uh, it's a question, but I think it's a small one. I mean, the real point is that you, you d until you get the basis for a functioning democratic society, the technical questions about electoral practices don't matter very much. I mean, the real question, I mean, Ralph Nader's done some terrific things. I think he's done extremely important things. But on democracy, I just disagree with him. I mean, democracy is not a matter of showing up every four years and saying, vote for me. You know, I mean, there has to be some, a lot going on in those four years. I mean, take countries that have a more functioning democracy than we do, like the second biggest country in the hemisphere, Brazil. Uh, we should be ashamed to have to look at other countries for a model. We have so many advantages over them. But take Brazil. Uh, they just had an election a couple of years ago. It wasn't a choice between two pampered rich boys who went to Yale and or made money because their families have uh, influence and wealth. Uh, no, it was they elected a uh, very impressive figure uh, from their own ranks, a peasant, a union organizer, he never had an advanced education. Uh, and that, how are they able to do it against tremendous odds? And this country with enormous poverty, tremendous inequality, great illiteracy, uh, tremendous concentration of, of uh, capital, media against them, the international investing community was trying to stop them. How'd they do it? Well, you know, they have popular organizations. 
you know, the landless workers movement is probably the most important popular organization in the world. It doesn't show up every four years to push a button. It's doing something every day. You know, building cooperatives, selling people on land, uh, uh, running regional elections. Uh, uh, the Workers' Party you know, its not an ideal institution by any means, but it's there all the time. They're working at every level, engaging people in all kinds of issues. Uh, there are professional associations. The unions function, not like here. And they're a major democratizing force, which is why they're under such attack. Uh, that's what's required to have a democratic election. I mean, I think there are technical things wrong with our electoral system, and that's not a particularly radical position. So, like the leading uh, 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 political theorist in the United States, the most respected one that deals with electoral processes, Robert Dahl at Yale, has been arguing for years that uh, you know the U.S. system ought to be turned to a parliamentary system uh, if it's going to be democratic, not a sort of first pass. The post system, and he has good arguments for that. Uh, and, that and that would mean not a third party, but parliament, you know, minority representation. Uh, and, that, and that would mean not a third party, but parliament, you know, minority representation. And I uh, can read his, I think his books are perfectly sound. They're right in the middle of the mainstream. Uh, and yeah, I think this, those suggestions make sense, but the major problem lies elsewhere. I mean, it lies in our using the enormous freedom and privilege that we have to act instead of sitting by and watching. Uh, that's what has to happen. Mm -hmm. Professor Chomsky, it's a real privilege to have you in, this, uh, in these two campuses. About 15 years ago, your intellectual cohort, the late Edward Said, was also here, mm -hmm. and I had the privilege, um, I have the privilege of being exposed to both of you, the, the intellectual giants of this world. Um, my question is, is this, maybe a slight comment, but also a question. Before the invasion of Iraq, there was considerable discussion in the media, especially on the East Coast, uh, in Washington Post, for example, that what has been labeled as a Bush doctrine in some quarters was labeled as a Sharon Bush doctrine. Because Ariel Sharon had indeed, back in 1981, December 18, 1981, as defense minister, had indeed talked about destabilizing the Middle East and preemptive strikes. Wouldn't you say the appropriate word? I know last night you talked to Gonzaga and the local newspaper today is talking about quoting you as the Bush doctrine. Would the appropriate terminology be shared here on Bush doctrine? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, Ed Said in some way was a very old and close personal friend, so I'm glad you brought him up. He's an amazing person, tremendous loss. Uh, in, in 1980, I, 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 I I think maybe, I don't know if they reported in the press, but I did, did come up last night and I said what I think. Uh, Israel cannot control U.S. policy. In fact, I don't even think you can influence it. It's a small country, very small. Uh, it made a fateful decision in 1971. Uh, we, uh, it's sort of out of history, but it happened. Like a lot of the important things, you know, you don't talk about it, but it's there. And you can find it. In 1971, Israel had a chance for full peace with the Arab world. Uh, Egypt under Sadat had offered a full peace treaty uh, in term, just without any mention of the Palestinians. Incidentally, that wasn't an issue then, uh, in return for uh, Israeli withdrawal from Egyptian territory. Jordan made a similar offer at the same time. Actually, those two offers were in accord with official U.S. policy, uh, withdraw, you know, settlement on, on the the international border, maybe minor and mutual adjustment, uh, and nothing about the Palestinians. That's the, what was happening at the time. Israel considered it. It recognized it to be a, what they called a genuine peace offer. This is the labor government, and so it's not your own. Uh, and they uh, decided to reject it because they preferred expansion to security. Uh, expansion at that time was into the northeastern Sinai, where Israel was driving out thousands of farmers and building an all-Jewish city, Yamit. 
Well, the crucial question is what's the United States going to do? That's what matters. Israel can't do anything on its own. Uh, it was debated internally in the U.S. Kissinger won the debate. His position was that there should be, and it's public, you know, uh, it should, he should, his position would be that there should be no negotiations. There should be what he called stalemate. In other words, only force, no diplomacy. Well, you know, kind of a rationale for that. There were very racist assumptions at the time, both in Israel and the United States, about the uh, incapacity of Arabs to uh, mount any military force. You know, they don't know which end of the gun to hold and all that stuff. It was really incredible. Uh, so Kiss making that estimate, uh, Kissinger just disregarded it, and so did Israel. Uh, the, and they went ahead. That led directly to the 1973 war, uh, which turned out to be a very close thing for Israel. You know, it came close to destruction, a very close thing for the world. You know, it came close to a nuclear war. Okay, at that point, uh, in Israel, there was a serious reassessment and a long discussion about the uh, disaster and the racism behind it and everything else. Here, nothing. Uh, in fact, here is just totally distorted. I won't go on with the story. Uh, but it's basically Kissinger's war. In 1979, at Camp David, uh, the United States accepted Sadat's 1971 proposal. And it's regarded here as a great triumph, diplomatic triumph. You know, Carter got the Nobel Prize. It's a diplomatic catastrophe. And they had rejected the offer in 1971. It took a major war and near disaster to force the United States to accept what had been offered in 71, but it's all reconstructed by you know, the doctrinal system. Uh, as far as preemptive war, and it conti continues to be true. I mean, Israel's dependent on U.S. decisions. Not entirely. So in 1981, Israel did make a preemptive strike that, Israel, that the U.S. was opposed to that same year. Uh, Israel bombed the Iraqi, um, uh, an Iraqi nuclear reactor. Uh, and the U.S. happened to be opposed to that at the time. Well, we have pretty good information about what uh, that's now reconstructed as uh, uh, preventing, uh, uh, delaying Iraq's nuclear weapons program. It was precisely the opposite. It's the typical effect of use of violence. Use of violence quite typically enhances violence. And that's what happened this time. The bombing of the reactor initiated Saddam's program. I mean, that reactor was inspected immediately by the head of Harvard's physics department, a specialist in nuclear power. And he wrote a long article about it in Nature, which is the world's leading preeminent uh, science magazine, in which he described in detail how this reactor couldn't have been used for nuclear, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons. It wasn't designed for that. Then he went into all the details. We now have evidence from Iraqi defectors uh, that that's exactly true, uh, that after the bombing, Saddam started off on a nuclear weapons development program. And that's uh, very commonly the effect of uh, preemptive use of violence. History is full of it. Uh, Iraq war, as I mentioned, is another. So yeah, there was a Sharon doctrine, but uh, the U.S. will do what it wants. It's far too powerful to be uh, influenced more than marginally by a small state. And I think if you look at the record, that's what you see. I mean, Sharon's current programs of taking over the West Bank are not new programs. Um, actually, the program that, with the wall and everything else is pretty much what he proposed that Ten years, uh, more than 10 years ago, 1992. He can do it because you are willing to pay for it. Uh, as long as Americans are willing to subsidize it and give the, the military and diplomatic uh, support for it, yeah, sure, they'll go ahead and do it. I mean, as soon as the, you say, we're not doing this anymore, it's over. In fact, the large majority of the American population are opposed to it. It's one of the other cases of the democratic deficit. The large majority of the population is in favor of the international consensus on a political settlement on the international border. Uh, but that the public, again, is out of public policy. And the consistent story right up to the present, again, which happens to be an extreme end, but it's a narrow spectrum, of supporting this takeover of the occupied territories, which is going to, it is going to destabilize the region. Of course, they all know that going to be a major source of terrorism. It's going to be a major source of threats. It may do us all in. You know. uh, okay, but uh, that's the short-term goal that the U.S. has been pursuing for years and still is.
in a more extreme way under Bush. Not because Sharon is forcing them to do it, but because that's their choice. Uh, just as nobody forced Kissinger to uh, insist on stalemate in 1971. Could have accepted Sadat's offer, you know. Could have had peace for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, again, I'd like to say thank you for coming. Um, it's a little high and a little short. Uh, my name is Alex McDonald, and I, I'm a would-be engineer here at Washington State University. Um, and before I ask my question, I'd like to second uh, the earlier comments to Community Action. And if anyone's interested, engineers and builders of borders meet Thursdays at 7 p.m. in Carpenter. Uh, <coughs> um, and you don't have to be an engineer or science major to participate at all, or architecture or construction management. Manager, rather. Um, so my question is, uh, IP or intellectual properties are, do you feel that they're an integral component to personal freedoms or a detriment? And what place does intellectual property have in uh, public and academic settings? That's a very interesting question, and it has an interesting history. Uh, the uh, World Trade Organization, the Uruguay Round that set up the World Trade Organization, uh, imposed uh, it's, it's called a free trade agreement. It's, in fact, a highly protectionist agreement. Uh, the U.S. is strongly opposed to free trade, just as business leaders are, just as they're opposed to a market economy. Uh, a crucial part of the Uruguay as business leaders are, just as they're opposed to a market economy. Uh, a crucial part of the Uruguay round, the World Trade Organization, NAFTA, and the rest of them, is a very strong, uh, what are called intellectual property rights. What it actually means is rights that guarantee monopoly pricing power to private tyrannies. So if you take, say, a drug corporation, uh, most of their profit, uh, the, the most of the serious research and development, the hard part of it, is funded by the public. In fact, most of the economy comes out of public expenditures through the state system, which is the source of most innovation and development. I mean, computers, the Internet, uh, you know, just go through the range. It's all coming out of the state system primarily. There is research and development in the corporate system, some, but it's mostly at the marketing end. Uh, and the same is true of drugs. Uh, but once the corporations are gain the benefit of the public paying the costs and taking the risks, they want to monopolize the profit. And uh, the intellectual property rights, uh, they're not for small inventors. In fact, you know, the people in doing the work and the corporations, they don't get anything out of it. Uh, you know, a dollar if they invented something. But uh, it's the corporate tyrannies that are making the profits, and they want to guarantee them. Uh, the World Trade Organization uh, proposed new enhanced intellectual property rights, patent rights, which means monopoly pricing rights, far beyond anything that existed in the past. In fact, they are not only designed to maximize monopoly pricing and profit, but also to prevent development. It's rather crucial. World Trade Organization rules introduced product patents. It used to be you could patent a process, but not the product, which means if some smart guy could figure out a better way of doing it, he, he could do it. They want to block that. It's important to block development and progress in order to ensure monopoly rights, so they have product patents. Well, if you take a look at, say, take U.S. history, okay? Suppose the colonies, after independence, had been forced to accept that regime. Uh, you know what we'd be doing now? Uh, first of all, there'd be very few of us here. But those of us who would be here would be pursuing our comparative advantage in uh, exporting uh, fish and fur. Uh, you know, that's what economists tell you is right. Pursue your comparative advantage. That was our comparative advantage. We certainly wouldn't have had a textile industry. Um, British textiles were way cheaper and better. Actually, British textiles were cheaper and better because Britain had crushed Irish and Indian superior textile manufacturers and stolen their techniques. So they were now the preeminent textile manufacturer by force, of course. Uh, the U.S. would never have had a textile industry. I mean, it grew up around Massachusetts, but the only way it could develop was by extremely high tariffs, uh, which protected unviable uh, U.S. industries. So the textile industry developed, and that has a spin-off into other industries. And so it continues. I mean, the U.S. would never have had a steel industry. Again, same reason. Uh, British steel was way superior. Uh, one of the reasons is because they were stealing Indian techniques. 
uh, British engineers were going to India to learn about steel making well into the 19th century. Uh, but Britain you know, ran the country by force so they could take what they knew and they developed a steel industry and the U.S. imposed extremely high tariffs, also massive government involvement you know, through the military system as usual, and the U.S. developed a steel industry and so it continues right up to the present. Furthermore, that's true of every single developed society. You take a look at that's one of the best known truths of economic history is that the only countries that developed are the ones that pursued these techniques. Uh, the ones that weren't, a, the, there were countries that were forced to adopt free trade, liberalization, the colonies, and they got destroyed. You know? I mean, the divide between the first and the third world is really since the 18th century. It wasn't very much in the 18th century. And it's very sharply along these lines. Well, you know, that's what the intellectual property rights are for. And in fact, there's a name for it but in economic history. Friedrich List, the famous German political economist in the 19th century, who was actually borrowing from Andrew Hamilton, uh, called it kicking away the ladder. First you use state power and violence to develop, then you kick away those procedures so that other people can't do it. Uh, that's, uh, intellectual property rights has very little to do with uh, the individual initiative. I mean, like Einstein didn't have any intellectual property rights on relativity theory. Uh, science and uh, you know, innovation is carried out by people who are interested in it. Um, that's the way science works. You know? I mean, there's an effort in very recent years to commercialize it, like to commercialize everything else. So you don't do it because it's exciting and challenging and you want to find out something new and you want the world to benefit from it. You do it because maybe you can make some money out of it. I mean, that's... Uh, well, you can make your own judgment about the moral value. I think it's extremely cheapening, but also destructive of initiative and development. And the, 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 the profits don't go back to individual inventors. Um, they're this very well-studied topic. I mean, take, say, one that's really well-studied and that MIT is involved in, uh, uh, mach uh, electron uh, computer-controlled machine tools, very fundamental component of the economy. Well, there's a very good study of this by David Noble, a uh, leading political economist. What he pointed out, what he discovered is that uh, the techniques were invented by some small guy, you know, manufacturing guy working in his garage somewhere in, I think, Michigan. Uh, and when the, when, actually when the MIT and mechanical engineering department learned about it, they picked them up and they developed them and extended them and so on. And the corporations came in and picked them up from them. And finally, it became a core part of U.S. industry. What happened to the guy who invented it? He's still probably working in his garage in Michigan or wherever it is. And that's very typical. Uh, I, I just don't think it has much to do with uh, innovation or independence. It has to do with protecting major concentrations of power, which mostly got their power as a public gift, and making sure that they can uh, maintain and expand their power. I don't, and these highly protectionist devices, I don't think, you really have to ram them down through people's throats. They don't make any economic sense or any other sense. So uh, what role, though, do you think that they should play in an academic public institution? Well, I don't think they should play any role. But uh, the, uh, I mean, since the, uh, since 1981, there was a, there was a, an amendment, by amendment, which gave universities the right to, uh, patent uh, uh, inventions that came out of their own research. Actually, that's a kind of a gag. I mean, nothing comes out of the university's own research. It comes out of public funding. That's how the university can function. That's how their research projects work. Uh, the whole thing is set up to socialize cost and risk to the general public. And then within that context, yeah, in your biology lab, you invent something. But I don't think universities should patent it. They should be working for the public good. And that means it should be available to the public. That's, uh, Thank you. So, Dr. Chomsky, I'm so thrilled that you're here. This, to me, is the biggest honor to have you here. You're, the, I think, the most important speaker we've ever had at WSU. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> because, but I took my son, my grandson, the Red Sox team. <laughs> Could you sign my book for me, please? Sure. <laughs> Just hang around afterwards, or now. <laughs> you mentioned the new bankruptcy law. 
last week when Barbara Boxer was asked how in the world that was ever passed, she said that the Republicans were really good with words. And I was thinking about um, euphemisms like uh, Clear Skies Act and Healthy Forests and some of the things that are coming out now as far as being anti-faith. And I'm wondering if you could comment on how do people living in small eastern Washington uh, communities uh, get their hands on or their ears on uh, information that's truly fair balance? Well, you're absolutely right about the, I mean, the last kind of 20 years, the re, I mean, you know, it's always, uh, politics has always been a pretty shoddy affair, but the last 10 or 20 years, mainly Republican Party politics have been taken out, have been dedicated to propaganda to a level that would have made George Orwell wince. I mean, just take a look at the name of every act that's passed by Congress. I mean, every one of them is straight out of Orwell. You know, it means exactly the opposite of what it says. And this has become an immense propaganda system. And there's a, I mean, there's a very good reason to it. What they're doing is stabbing the population in the back. And you can't let people know that. So you have to somehow find ways of mobilizing them so they won't see what's going on, what's happening to them. Uh, so therefore you bring up uh, so-called moral values, you know, um, whatever it may be. Any device you can for getting people to pay attention to something that doesn't matter uh, to those who hold real economic power. I mean, the, the moral values of the Bush administration and its predecessors are extremely simple in essence.